Puffin Forest. I feel I should make this clear from the outset. I don't know anything about Mr. Forest here. I'm sure he's a great guy. The only work of his I've seen is the video I'm about to respond to and his follow-up where he DM'd a game of 4E for some other D&D YouTubers. Maybe I'll go after that video someday, but for today we're here for the video that started it all. For B-Roll today, I'm playing a game I first played over 10 years ago now, an untitled story. Indie game by Matty Thorson, creator of well-known indie hit Celeste. Also, you may have looked at the time code and noticed this video is quite long. If you're a fan of Puffin Forest, this may lead you to call my video bad simply because the response is so much longer than the original. To those people, I would like to offer a simple analogy. Imagine I give you five minutes in a public bathroom with the goal of making as much of a mess as you can. How badly could you wreck that bathroom? Now, how long would it take someone to clean that bathroom? Longer than five minutes? I think that makes my point. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. I'll be skipping the first few minutes because it's just set up and there's nothing I really disagree with. If you want to watch the whole video to be sure I'm not taking anything out of context, there's a link in the description. He does explicitly say this isn't a review, it's just his memories of the game. That's fine, but he does end up making some pretty definitive statements that just make you think he didn't do any research for this video at all. Let's listen to him describe his first D&D gaming experience. First time I played D&D. I was looking forward to this game for the longest time. Finally got a chance to play it, and man, I just absolutely hated it. Just, I, oh my god. Don't get me wrong, I loved role-playing and getting into character and running through the dungeon. That that part was really fun, but man, the combat just dragged. It was so slow and painful, and you didn't have any meaningful choices, and everyone had this rigid character class that restricted what they could do, and the fights were just not fun. Okay, so I'm going to cut him off there. He adds one piece of information in a sec that puts complaints about combat in a slightly better light, but I still have some issues. This sounds like he started at level 1, which I definitely recommend for players who are brand new, but I will agree that level 1 gives you basically no meaningful combat choices in regards to your powers. His comment on the class structure being rigid though confuses me. The whole point of a class system in any game is to differentiate characters and give them different strengths and weaknesses. But even within classes, there are plenty of different builds you can go with and powers you can choose. Maybe this is the limit of only having a few of the books? If you only have access to the two books that your DM happens to own, then things do get pretty limited. Although also, I should mention we had eight players and everyone was new, so yeah, there's that. Eventually the group shrunk down to a more manageable four to five players. Eight players is definitely nuts. Even with all veteran players, combat would be a slog with eight of them. Five players and one DM is definitely the most I would ever want to play with. There's... And after that first session, we still all had fun hanging out, and we said, yeah, it'll be more fun once we learn the system and figure out what's going on. Two months later, we were still struggling with it, but we're like, yeah, just give it some more time. We're, we're new to this. Until, you know, we've really only been playing for like a year. Now's the time when we really know what we're doing. Up until the last session I played, could not tell you what was going on in that game. I played 4th edition for over a year and a half, and the entire time, if you would pause the game, it would be like, explain to me what's going on in this scene. I could not give you a straight answer. It was just way too complicated to tell. I know 4E is a lot crunchier on the combat than other editions of D&D, and maybe this is just me, but I've never had an issue understanding what was going on in my games. This really does sound like a you problem. And I know this isn't supposed to be a review, but the way he speaks makes it sound like these are issues with the game itself and not just things he experienced. I played a few sessions of 3.5 at the same time when I was playing 4th edition, and let me tell you, I was playing a dwarf fighter, I remember I'd pull out my bow, and a fire shot, and roll damage, and that was it. Okay, now I'm confused. Earlier you said that characters didn't have any meaningful choices, but now you're saying you liked in 3.5 where all you did was shoot and roll damage. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't seem like you're making a meaningful choice. And in 4e, if you just want to attack without a bunch of options, you can play an Essentials class. Essentials came out late in 4E's life cycle. All the classes were simplified versions of other classes. They focused heavily on basic attacks and generally only had one encounter power which they got more uses of as they leveled up. Sometimes they have different powers, but the main thrust of them is to limit your options so it's nice and easy to understand for newer players. They're the perfect option if you just want to shoot your bow, roll damage, and that's it. In 4th edition, I would pull out my mace, run up to someone, and use my smack someone with my mace and give my ally plus 3 to the next attack power. 
But then as I approached, I'd be in their aura from their frost armor, which is forming crystals in my limbs, giving me a minus one penalty to the attack roll. But wait, he's also standing next to his portal he's open to the nether realms, and inky black tendrils are wrapping around him, giving a plus one bonus to his AC. But in response, one of my buddies has cast a small miniature sun, partially blinding everyone in two square burst, means AC minus one. So when I go in to make my attack, he uses immediate interrupt to swap with his alley next to him, taking the blow. Aha, but then his fire burst armor goes off, triggering me to get a blast of fire. But wait a minute, our fighter has marked him, triggering his immediate attack whenever the enemy makes a move. And the warlock has summoned his Niasis claws, which are the celestial claws that levitate above his head in the air. If he moved, he would take another additional three points of damage. But wait a minute, the enemy shaman has summoned a flaming chariot, which gets to move over your square, doing two points of fire damage. If you draw a new weapon on your next turn, then you're going to take another two points of damage. This is supposed to be an introductory game! Well, when you put it like that, it sounds way more complicated. Also, I've played a lot of 4e. No game I've ever played has ever gotten that complicated, even at higher levels. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say all this really was going on. I agree that's a lot for one person to keep track of, but you're not one person. Given all the things he described, there's six people at this table. It doesn't take a genius to say, hey guys, there's a lot of stuff to keep track of. So how about everyone keep track of their own buffs and stuff so we don't overload ourselves? We have no context for what level this particular example is from, but I have criticism for either option. Either this is a low-level encounter, in which case there's no way there's 15 things to keep track of, or this is a higher-level game, in which case everyone should understand their character in the system, so it's less of an issue. Also, if describing what's causing the buffs debuffs is too confusing for you, then just use the numbers. Or at least, that's the way it should go down. Really, what would happen is, I would run up, bop someone for 4 points of damage, and then a turn or two later someone would say, Wait a second, was, wasn't my minister's son there? Did, did, didn't he have a penalty? Hey, hey wait, did, he, he had an immediate move. Wait, if he had an immediate move, d didn't I have an attack? In that situation, there are no good actions. If you rewind to fix the fight, it feels unfair. And if you just play it out, it feels like you got cheated out of a fight. As if you won because of an accident. If that happens, then I agree that there's not a great action. My groups have always played so that if a turn goes by and you realize you forgot a buff slash debuff, then that's on you and we just get to move on. We trust that people aren't going to pretend they forgot the monster debuffed them. But this is why it's important for everyone to remember their own numbers. It's on the DM to remember a monster debuffed a player, just like it's on the players to remember if they debuffed a monster. I remember combat was always like one step forward, two steps back. You go back and forth, back and forth on initiative, making sure that all the abilities went off. Or worse, oh, w wait wait a second, I was supposed to have a plus two bonus this whole time. Can I roll damage for five attacks that should have hit? And once again, I get it, as fifth edition has that a bit. But there's one or two things you gotta keep in mind. In fourth, there was just there's so many. But because every character and enemy could put down its own one round status effects, there's a ton of stuff to keep track of. Nothing much for me to say except to reiterate that keeping track of your own numbers and when they're relevant solves a lot of these issues. And also, guess what? It didn't matter because the fights were so easy that if you've got a bunch of damage bonuses, you'd still win anyways. But that was more how we were running it. Later on, he makes some more criticisms of the game that come down to how they were run, so I just wanted to point out now that he acknowledges his issue with easy combat was because of how they ran it. In 4th edition, they kind of didn't really have spells, they had powers. Every single character had about the same number of at-will encounter and daily powers. Each power would have different cooldown periods to wait before you get it back. They streamlined a few of the mechanics to make them simpler, but then added a flood of other ones. So the rinse and repeat of combat was actually took a long time. I remember finishing combat and just being relieved, like, oh, it's over. Like instead of being excited, yeah, get some. It'd be like if you were at the dentist's office waiting for an hour or two, and then your name finally gets called, and you're not thinking to yourself, Woo, yeah! It's more like, ugh, finally. I'm not sure what he means by power simplifying some mechanics, but adding a flood of other ones. Maybe he'll go into that later. He just said combat was easy because of how they ran it, but now he's complaining it was a slog, which is also just down to how the DM runs it. I won't pretend like combat was always great. Original monsters had way too much health and didn't do enough damage. Lots of groups just played with monsters at half health and dealing double damage. Which is essentially did the same thing in an official way when they released Monster Manual 3. If they are having issues with combat, I don't know why no one would think to look up on the official Wizards forums, which were very active in the 4e heyday, if other people were having these issues and how they solved them. It feels like no one in this group actually cared about the game or else they would have come up with some kind of solution. 
that ended up hurting the role-playing and narration. Instead of a player saying, I offer up a vengeful prayer to my god which dispels the warlock's hex, we'd just say, okay, this thing gives him a minus two, and this thing gives him a plus two, so that we could just say they cancel. We'd just boil things down to their numbers. Instead of, blessings of Keratos be upon you, it'd be, that's a six, it's just a plus six, just a six, just take your six. If Dylan did start narrating, we'd be like, we ain't got time for that, get your monologue and out of here, Dave! You're in a line, and there's 25 other things that need to resolve before your turn ends. And even if you did start narrating and describing your powers, crashing irons of a thousand memories. Initially, it sounds really cool, but by like the 37th time you used your power, just be like, 15 to hit, that's a hit. That's uh, 2d6 damage, and he's stunned for one round. I know I let him play for a while there, but I really wanted to be sure he made his point about how all of this stuff ruins the flavor and narration. And he's right. If you want to play 4e and only talk about the numbers in combat, then that's totally something you can do. But that's your choice. Narration getting old after 30 times is something that will happen no matter what. Everything ends up getting boiled down to numbers if you play it long enough. Sometimes you just have to be practical. If you want to narrate, you can easily save it for daily powers when you kill an enemy or when something super cool happens. This doesn't have to be an all or nothing proposition where you either narrate everything or nothing. Also, he makes that comment about 25 other things needing to resolve. I'm sure he's being hyperbolic for comedic purposes, but I've had entire fights where 25 things didn't need to resolve, let alone think 25 things in one turn. Just saying. Or you'd have some power that sounded pretty cool, like you summon your shadow to stab some guy in the back for three points of damage. But the system was pretty rigid. It's not like you had like a shadow familiar. You had a power which said that you could use your shadow to stab someone in the back for three points of damage. And that was it. Which to be honest, spells in D&D do have that kind of problem where they're too specific sometimes. Occasionally a system will have it written, you have a shadow and can use it to do a variety of things, yada yada yada, one of which includes stabbing someone in the back for three points of damage, which allows for variety. But this, this system, this was not like that. He says the counter to his argument in this section, it's not a 4e problem of the power being too specific, it's a D&D problem. Also, if you want a familiar that can do a variety of things, you can summon something worth a ritual, or just take a familiar with the familiar feat. If you had a variety of powers, you think, ooh, that's a lot of choice. Really, that's not how it turned out. You just start from your most powerful ability and just go down the list to the weakest, and then whenever they came off cooldown, you just rinse and repeat, just because each time you can only use it once. Which meant that in a fight, you'd use powers A, B, and C. Sometimes you'd use B, A, C, or C, B, A. Ooh. But it always had to be a combination of those three, and you could only use them once. This is another section where it just seems like he wants a simpler game. He starts off saying you always use your powers in order A, B, C, then immediately says sometimes you do a different order, so point disproven. Then he says you can only use each power once, like it's inherently a bad thing. To me it sounds like he wants to use the same spell multiple times a fight so he can just pick the best one and spam it without having to think. The only other strategy was like, don't target the one hit point minions with your heavy spells, save that for the boss. But that was kind of it. There was some strategy with positioning, like, this enemy has a flame aura, who's going to stand next to him? Not the wizard! That was it. Now you know all you need to, to succeed in 4th edition Dungeons Dragons combat. Congratulations. The biggest challenge was always remembering rules of the game anyway. So I don't know if he's lying, or just knows nothing about 4e. I don't like calling people liars, so I'll work under the assumption he just did no research for the video. The strategy in 4e is the best part of the combat, at least to me. When it comes to targeting, the DM should make it hard. Like, say you have an enemy that darts in and out of combat, making them hard to lock down, and also a big scary guy walking towards you from the other end of the room. If the wizard has one spell that can immobilize, there's a real choice of, do I lock down this annoying skirmisher in the hopes that we can kill it quickly, or do I lock down the scary guy so we have another turn to prepare ourselves? And that's just off the top of my head. 4e is so much more than just use your big spell on the big guy and keep the ranged characters out of melee, and it frustrates me that he boiled it down to such a simple and bad sounding system. We had these two hour long slugfests that we had to wade through, sometimes up to three to four hours. There was one time I was away going to a job interview. I came back halfway through. Still with my work suit on, I enter in, up at the top of the stairs, and this is what I come in to see. Before he describes the scene, I just want to point out he's already poisoned the well by describing their sessions as slugfests. Not every session can be the most exciting, but if every time it's a slog to just get through, then you need to talk with your group and figure out what's going on. Now, let's hear what he saw. One of the players is sleeping, snoring loudly. 
Another player has his 3DS out and is playing a game. One person is on her phone. Another player is trying to stay awake, but his arms are folded. Head is down, but I know he's sleeping. The DM is rolling through all the effects, writing down notes. Okay, this is this. Ice effect is over. He saves against the poison. There's a minus one still on him. The mark condition is down. Zod, it's your turn. Ah! The sleeping guy wakes up. Ah, okay. He picks up his dice. He rolls. 14. That's a miss. Okay. And he goes back to sleep. The DM finally notices that I'm there. He's too busy with combat and says, Hey guys, uh, Ben's here. Yay. They gave an anemic hello. And I had this realization, like, this is what we look like. I came here voluntarily. Like, I didn't have to come here. This was my Saturday. We'd play from noon to midnight. Like, I can't believe I don't have other stuff to do. I was unemployed at the time and, and didn't actually have better things to do. Wow. Okay, so first I just want to point out that he said the sessions were three to four hour slugfests, but now he's saying they played from noon to midnight, so one of those statements can't be true. Second, he presents this like, see, this is what 4E did to us. People can't pay attention and stay awake because it's so boring. But all I hear is, combat took so long because no one could care enough to pay attention and help the DM. Tabletop RPGs are collaborative experience. If people aren't paying attention, then the group has to figure out what's going on and what can be fixed about it. Of course, combat will take forever if half the party is literally sleeping when it's not their turn. 4E is a strategy game when it comes to combat, so if you're not paying attention, you won't know what the state of things will be and you have to get caught up every single time your turn comes around. It just sounds like this group didn't particularly like combat, but instead of trying to find a system better suited to their needs or trying to homebrew 4E to do that, they just ran it by the book and had a bad time. I didn't even get into the fact that the monsters also have abilities as well, coming on and off cooldowns. With a lot of enemies, their big selling point is that they can take hits to really sell the player's abilities and powers. So giving monsters a bunch of powers does not make the PCs feel any more heroic. If a player has a power that lets them knock an enemy into the air and throw 10 daggers into their chest, they feel pretty cool. But if all the enemies have that stuff, it doesn't feel fun, and it's not even fun for the DM to run through it. It just means there's more stuff he's got to worry about. If the DM is keeping track of everything, including players' triggers, then yes, this is an issue. But this just brings me back to what I said before. Everyone keeps track of their own numbers, and it's better for everyone. Also, he complains monsters doing the same thing as players makes the players feel lame. To my knowledge, no monster has the exact same power as a player. They sometimes have similar ones, but never exactly the same. Unlike in 5e, where monsters literally cast the same spells players do, so I don't even understand his complaint since it's worse in the edition that he likes. Character creation was simple because they didn't let you make choices. When you were first making your character and leveling up, you got to select new powers. Really, each class had two builds, and every power would usually work for one build or another. Like the cleric had four at-will powers, and you can pick two. But two of them work with a mace, and the other two work long range. So, if you used a mace, you would pick the first two. If you didn't, you'd pick the other two. So the choice would be, hmm, do I take this power which synergizes with my build, or do I take this power that I can't use as completely useless? Hmm, decisions, decisions. I know I said I don't want to call Ben here a liar, but that's just a straight up lie. As was shown in my 4E Primer video, link in the description, there are way more than just four powers to choose from for at will. The only explanation I have is that he only looked at one of the books with clerics, so he only saw four at wills. Every other type of power also has plenty of options. Some will synergize with your build better than others, but it's almost never a take this power or you're playing your character wrong type situation. What was worse for me was I played as a war priest, which they don't even get to pick powers. They select a domain and automatically get abilities. When they level up, the game selects what powers you have. There is almost no choices past first level. Well, now all of his complaints about not making any choices make a whole lot more sense. War priest is one of the essentials classes that I was talking about earlier. But then that just brings into question his complaints about things being too complicated. All he ever had to do was walk up and hit someone with his mace. Unless War Priest is different somehow to other essentials classes. Let me check. Uh, Alright, War Priest. Uh, 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 okay. Alright, I have looked over at War Priest and it has the worst of both worlds for essentials. Instead of the standard encounter power that you use multiple times, to you get powers based on the domain you chose at character creation. So you both have no options and also have to learn a bunch of powers. Sounds awful. 
Stats were another thing as well. Almost all of your abilities would use one of your primary stats. If a paladin swung a sword with a power that was charisma to hit and charisma to damage, a warlock might cast his spells using constitution, constitution to hit, and constitution to damage. So you would get nothing from putting ranks in any other stat. There would be a secondary one where you'd get some secondary benefits. Woo! But this entire concept of mixing and matching stats, different builds, that wasn't a thing. We didn't do that. Once again, Ben contradicts himself within seconds of saying his point. So you get nothing from putting points in other stats, but you have a secondary stat you get some benefit from. Also, he's doubly wrong because your other stats contribute to your defenses and skills. Also, I have no clue what he means about different builds not being a thing. Each class has at least two builds, usually more, and they all play differently from each other. The fighter alone has builds focused on temp HP to make you tougher, freehand grappling builds to lock down single enemies harder, two weapon builds to spread the love, and none of those play anything like each other. Also, also, his complaint about stats is just a general D&D problem. Every class in every edition basically focuses on one stat while ignoring the rest, with very few exceptions. If you put ranks into your primary stat, you were good at everything. If you didn't, you weren't. Yeah, except for all the skills that key off different stats and defenses too. God, it's like you didn't even look at the books before this video. Then there was the party roles. Really, there were only actually four different characters. Controller, Leader, Defender, and Striker. A class in 4th edition was just kind of like a reskinning of the base four characters. I remember- Whoo boy. So, there's a lot to unpack there. This line is what made me want to make that primer video before this one. I would have felt weird describing all the roles fully in this video. Also, I like how Controller and Striker are in the same box. I know I joked about Controllers being the least of the roles, but they have their place. They're not just bad Strikers. In his next point, he goes more into that awful comment about how all the classes are just reskins of each other, so we'll hold off on that. For now, I want to read that fine print he had on the screen. The first one is about how you're supposed to have one of each role. That was only ever a recommendation, and nothing more. Having a variety of roles keeps you a balanced party. Going all leaders might keep you alive with all that healing, but you also won't be able to kill anything. Also, this little bit about only having all the roles when the DM demanded it is funny. My first game I was a wizard, which is a controller. Not because the DM required it, but because the party was missing one and I like filling in the missing role. Now, the second bit of text. It's weird to say you didn't have time in your own video, you could have just made it longer. Secondly, saying general similar powers cancel each other out is incredibly dishonest. His example of marks overriding each other is the only case of similar powers cancelling each other out. Rangers can quarry the same target, and two warlocks can curse the same target with a feat. Having multiple of the exact same class in the same party is incredibly rare anyways. Defenders are the only role that consistently have the ability to mark enemies, so this issue comes up with multiple in your party. But they can just focus on different enemies, and there, problem solved. So, yeah, incredibly dishonest to say that roles will cancel each other out. Defenders are the only role with that issue. Strikers won't stop each other's damage amp abilities, and leaders won't prevent each other's buffs and heals. I switch from playing as a cleric to a bard, and I'm like, huh, a lot of these abilities are similar, because they're both leaders. They have similar powers, but with the names filed off, and some small changes. The powers are basically reshuffled around and dealt out again. This point is just baffling to me. The whole point of the role system is so classes in the same role are similar for balance purposes, but they all play differently. I can't speak to the similarities between Cleric and Bard, but I have played Bard and Warlord, and those classes play incredibly differently, despite both of them being leaders. I played as a Cleric. We had a power called Healing Word, which would heal plus a d6 twice per encounter. A Warlord had Inspiring Word, which would heal plus a d6 twice per encounter. A Bard had Majestic Word, which would heal plus a d6 twice per encounter. They're all the same power just with a name change. This is actually so scummy. This is the part that really got me the first time I watched this. Even now, years later, as I write this script, it's just infuriating. In the corner, he brings up one difference. The bard healing power shifts the person you heal one square. Other than that, they all get little bonuses. Shaman heals the extra dice to someone next to their spirit companion, so two people get heals. Ardent gives a bonus to either attack or defense, depending on class feature. Room Priest gives a bonus to damage or defense, based on what state they're in. 
Clerics don't get anything in the power itself, but their features make their heals do more than any other leader. And Warlord doesn't get anything nice, but they do have the unique feat Fight On, allowing them to use an additional use of Inspiring Word that other classes don't get for their own healing power. Also, I haven't even addressed the fact that Healing Word and its ilk are the only powers in the game that are this similar to each other. And they did this for game balance purposes, so there wasn't one leader that was just leaps and bounds better at healing in the fight than any other leader. As far as I know, and I know quite a bit about 4e, there are no powers between classes that are so similar you could claim they're the same power with a different name. So this point is just the worst. I, like I said, I don't want to call him a liar, but it just it feels like he's lying about this. Between all the leaders, while the classes might have specialized in one thing or another, there was a lot of similarities. There was a lot of AC, temporary hit points being given out, uh, boosting uh, attacks or lowering damage. Between the Bard and Cleric, it was like playing the same character over again. But that was how they were able to have dozens and dozens of different classes is because they kind of recycled some of the similar abilities. All defenders would have abilities involving marking. All controllers would have powers that move people around. And all strikers would have passives that boosted their damage, just reskinned between the different classes. Ugh, God, it's like he doesn't understand what the word roll means. They do similar things to each other by design, but just because all defenders mark, all controllers move people around, and all strikers have damage-boosting passives, doesn't mean they all play the same as each other. <sighs> okay, I'll, I'll focus on defenders since they're the ones that I have the most experience with. I'll talk about my three favorite defender classes. I've talked about fighters and all of their builds, but generally a fighter will mark one enemy and stick on them. They aren't very good against a horde, but in a one-on-one -on -one fight, a fighter is who you want. Paladins can mark many enemies at once, sometimes ones even several squares away. Importantly, the paladin mark punishment just happens, no action needed, so they can leave their reaction up to do other things. Wardens mark every enemy adjacent to them once per turn. They use their reaction up to punish unlike the paladin, but also unlike the paladin, they have a lot of abilities that make zones of difficult terrain, among other things, to keep enemies next to them, giving the enemies no choice but to fight the warden. All three of these classes are defenders that mark enemies. Never when playing any of them have I thought, oh, this is just like when I was playing the other one. Because they're all different. They all have their own strengths and weaknesses, and it's incredibly disingenuous of Ben here to say that all defenders are the same simply because they mark enemies. You notice also I'm just describing attack and combat powers. Really, most if not all of the powers were combat focused. Utility spells and abilities like you know in 5th edition were kind of not present in 4th edition. I mean, I mean, technically they did have utility abilities, but when I say utility, I mean is that they were powers that were meant to be used outside of combat. I won't pretend like 4e isn't very combat focused. It is. But 4e does have utility powers that are intended for out of combat use. And if you're in the kind of game where those will be useful, then you can take them. Also, you can totally use combat abilities out of combat as long as your DM is no total stick in the mud. Uh, one time when I was playing a wizard, I forget the exact context, but there was some water that would be more useful if, if it was ice. I just asked if I could use my Frost Blast power to freeze it, and he told me to roll for it. That was an attack power used out of combat, and I'm sure there are plenty of other cases you could make with other powers that could be useful outside of combat. They had rituals, which would cost 10 minutes to cast and would cost gold pieces. I remember those spells being too expensive to afford. One time in an emergency, we had to pool our gold together in order to cast Tensor's Floating Disc once during an emergency. But since they were costly, we tended to save our money and had to save them up for other magic items. That Tensor's Disc was the only time we cast a ritual spell. But that was also because we were playing in a low gold setting. These spells were either not in the game or if you didn't have the gold on hand, then you couldn't comprehend languages, you couldn't detect magic, you couldn't use- Okay, I'll cut him off there. He goes on for about 15 more seconds naming all the rituals he can think of. Once more, he explained what the issue was. He played in a low gold setting. In that kind of setting, of course rituals will be hard to do. In my primer video, I mentioned why I understand rituals costing gold and time. Magic just makes things way too easy. In a normal setting, the gold just stops you from spamming rituals. In a low gold setting, it makes ritual casting basically untenable. But again, that's not an issue with 4e, that was just an issue with his group. Also, also, if he wanted to do rituals, they could have just talked with the DM and said, hey, can we get rid of these gold requirements since we're in a low gold setting? 
And again, I know this isn't supposed to be a review, but when he says that all the classes are the same, or implies rituals are super hard to cast all the time, those aren't just his memories. Those are statements he's making about the game, and they're just wrong. Also, no multi-classing. Oh my god, is this part. If you decided to play a rogue at first level, then you were a rogue permanently. They had hybrid classing. Oh boy. Before he goes into hybrid classing, I just have to clarify he's straight up wrong about there being no multi-classing. It just works differently than it does in other editions. Instead of taking levels in another class, you take a feat that gives you something the other class has. Usually an at will power once per encounter and training in a skill. But just because it's not the same, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The first multi-class feat is like taking one or two levels in that class. Then there are power swap feats which are comparable to taking more levels in that class. You can still have a rogue fighter or whatever without having to go full hybrid. Speaking of hybrid... There are a few problems with this. One, you had to declare this at the beginning, during character creation. You couldn't play three levels and then be like, now I'm a hybrid. Two, it had to be exactly 50-50. If you were 10th level, five were in one class, five were in the other. And each time you leveled up, you picked a power from one, and then picked a power from the other. Back and forth. Three, it was a supplement! You had to go out and buy a secondary rulebook that gave you the hi special hybrid rules and special hybrid classes you could use for hybrid rules and was not allowed in the base rulebook! Four, you could only hybrid two classes. No more. Not three, not four, two. Only two. The system was so restrictive, it was just it was not like multi-classing at all. He presents all of these things about hybrids like they're inherently bad when they just maybe aren't the way he would have wanted them. Let's go through the points he makes. 1. The whole flavor behind hybrids is you're only partially trained as your classes because of reasons in your backstory. So maybe you were a street urchin but one day got accepted into the royal guard, but your old life still comes back to you. That could be a rogue fighter hybrid. So of course you'd have to make that choice at first level if it's part of your backstory. This isn't even mentioning how your DM could totally just allow you to hybrid at third level if you're in a home campaign. You'd basically just build a new character with the same name, but you could do it. It's not that hard. 2. The 50-50 thing is just an annoyance he has with the system. There's nothing inherently wrong with it being 50-50. Ben just wants the ability to only have a few things from another class, which he can do with the multi-classing rules he doesn't know exist. 3. It was a supplement because the hybrid rules were complicated and a little janky. I wouldn't recommend a hybrid as someone's first character, unless they were getting help from a more experienced player to make sure it didn't totally suck. 4. This is just the same as point 2. There's nothing inherently wrong with only being able to hybrid two classes. I'm glad they stopped at two. The rules are already weird enough. I can't imagine how much of a mess they would be if you could hybrid three or more classes together. Besides, why would you? The classes were not designed to synergize with other classes. If you had a secondary class, you'd have to dump ranks into making you terrible at both. So it's like they bring out this rule set and then punish you for using it. Hybrid characters were never meant to be this amazing thing to replace multi-classing. Multi-classing still exists, he just doesn't seem to know where to look for it, I guess. They were introduced in Player's Handbook 3 as an option for veteran players who wanted something different. The classes don't obviously mix, but you can combine them in fun ways. My personal favorite is Paladin Warlock, focusing on charisma. You can make lots of hybrids work, even things that are really out there like Barbarian Wizard. You just have to be creative about it. Then we had skill challenges. Skill challenges. Oh yes, skill challenges. Another section of this video that just blows my mind every time I hear it. In many of the other systems, the players would say, I want to lift this rock. And the DM goes, okay, that sounds like a strength check. And they'd roll and either they'd succeed or fail. They had those too. But also in 4th edition, you'd portray a scene such as, okay, the boat is sinking, there's all these people on it, and there would be a list of various activities that they could perform. In any other RPG, you would establish a scene and say, what are you guys doing? But that format didn't work well in skill challenges because players would say, I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. And you wouldn't have it on your sheet, and like that wasn't one of the rolling options. So he starts off fine, identifying that 4E still has one-off rolls for things, and gives the vibe of what skill challenges look like. But then he goes and gives away what his issue was. The DM ran them too strictly. I assume his examples are from pre-made adventures, because otherwise the DM was making up all the rolling options anyways, so anything unexpected from the players could easily be incorporated. It's not the game's fault that your DM ran them poorly. The way it was supposed to be run, the players don't tell you what they're doing. The DM tells them what they're doing. You say, here are the options that you can do. Bailing water over the side, carrying people to safety, 
are doing medicine checks on people or checking history to see if there's another place to dock the boat. And they can confirm. So, yeah, that's how they were presented in the book. But it's not that hard to just give your players a skill to roll if they want to try something other than what's listed. With what he said, the good skills would be athletics, maybe endurance, heal, and history. If you're not good at any of those, you can either roll bad checks, or you can do what everyone else did and figure out how to use what you're good at. Say you're good at perception. You'd say something like, hey, can I go up to a high place and try to spot something useful? And the DM would almost always say sure. Unless you're trying something nonsensical, like trying to intimidate people into feeling better or something. If your DM told you these are the only skills you can use and nothing else, then they were running it poorly and you should have a chat with them about it. Now that raises the question, if you didn't like it, why didn't you just ignore what was written down? You don't have to do it. Yes, Ben. Excellent point. If your group doesn't like skill challenges, despite it likely being the DM's fault, you could just choose to not do them. Let's hear his rebuttal. Yeah, exactly. That's what would happen. You'd pull up the skill challenge, go, yeah, we're not doing that, and then completely ignore it. That was how a lot of people did skill challenges. Well, that confirms they were running pre-made adventures, and I'm sure lots of people figured out how to run skill challenges well and not the rigid way you did them. Just saying, oh, lots of people skipped them so they were bad is really reductive. It'd be like if you were playing a choose-your-own-adventure and they said, The players now take reeds from the side of the river, and we have a raft to float downstream. Go to page 70. Or, the players take cannonballs and use them to dam up the river so they can walk across. Go to page 39. The odds that the players would say exactly that is unlikely, and if they don't, then you just ignore the rest of the challenge, because the results assume they're going to be doing one of the options. Yes, if that's how the skill challenge is written, then it's a bad skill challenge. I haven't DM'd that much, but I did do a little bit of a Wizards pre-made adventure, and there was a skill challenge. You were interrogating a goblin or something before the guards put him in the stocks to have tomato thrown at him or whatever. It gave a list of what you could use, and even some fun things, like if you used Intimidate but failed, it made future checks harder, but didn't assume the players would do something really narrow, so I'm not sure what he read, but it's nowhere near what my experience was. And then they would try and involve lesser-used skills in weird ways. Like, one time there were ghosts haunting a church, and the question was, how do you get rid of the ghosts? What do you think is the primary skill used to get rid of ghosts? This made me so mad. Don't worry, Ben. I know all about getting so mad. If I were to guess what skills were to get rid of ghosts, pretending I hadn't seen this video before, I would say either religion or arcana. It's thievery and dungeoneering! Because you say, I'm going to roll thievery, and if you succeed the DM tells you, Oh hey, your character is looking around, and he notices that because of his thievery, there's secret floorboard where there's skeletons hidden. Good thing you rolled thievery, because you wouldn't have been able to find it if you didn't roll the thievery. If you had rolled Perception, that would have just let you notice the paintings on the wall. Well, the real problem here is the DM allowing people to just say, I'm rolling thievery, and not describe what they're doing. But I agree Perception not helping out is dumb. But in those situations, it's up to the DM to decide that it doesn't make sense and change it. On the fly, I would allow Perception to notice the floorboards are loose, and Religion and History to have knowledge about remains being connected to ghosts. Then Thievery or Dungeoneering would let you get into the tight space and retrieve the skeletons. I'm sure there's a better way, but I think that sounds decent. Also, you had to stay in initiative while doing the skill challenges, so the characters go up and talk to the king. I start talking because I'm the rogue, because my initiative is the highest, and there are paladin goes, etc. Like, that's not how conversations work! Again, this is a situation where the way it's run is what's causing the issues. Maybe in the rules it says you have to stay in initiative for skill challenges, but I've never adhered to that. Normally the only rule is everyone has to go once before repeating. Also, I guess this example is a challenge to convince the king to give you something? Even though I wouldn't do it that way, I could see initiative working. You say your argument however quickly you can think of it. Plus, you can delay your turn in initiative if you really want someone else to go first. Or sometimes we'd figure out a thing and it's like, can someone make a history check on this guy? I would, but I'm the wizard and I'm going at the end of the skill challenge. Again, this is solved either by having everyone go once and then looping, or delaying your turn. And it's not like combat where delaying means an enemy might get to attack before you go. There's no enemies in a skill challenge. The problem is, there was so much I didn't like with the game that I couldn't homebrew it to fix the problems. It's one thing to change lore. That's easy. It's another thing to change one or two mechanics. Tricky, but a bit more doable. And it's another thing when your problematic rule is all of them! Well, m most of them. Really, when you stop and think about it, isn't every system just a homebrewed version of every other system? 
at this point, it really sounds like he should have just moved his group to another system. Sure, you can homebrew a whole lot, but at some point it's just more practical to say, this system isn't for me, and move on. Really, none of my complaints that I have are a big deal in and of themselves. There's no one rule that I can point to that's a problem. I've played games with restrictive character creation, and it's been fine. And I've played in games with heavy combat. That's not a problem. And the fact that combat can kind of get repetitive and there's nothing much you can do outside of it, there's a lot of other RPGs that I've played that have the same problem. Even the fact that they don't let you multi-class isn't a big deal. Or that they recycle powers between only four base characters. Or even the fact that they force you to take certain powers with different classes. That's not a problem. He starts off so well, then he gets multi-classing wrong again, and still spouts the same lies about all the classes being the same. Even saying it forces you to take powers isn't correct. A subset of classes forces you to take powers. This subset of classes was specifically designed to streamline things so you didn't have to think about taking powers. They were made for people like you, apparently, who just want to shoot people with their bow for damage, but you still aren't happy with it. But... The fact that you have long repetitive combat in a combat-focused game where there's only four base characters using restrictive powers which are recycled between different characters that you're required to take without allowing multi-classing with generic fights and nothing you can do outside of combat, that... that's a problem. Damn, dude. That does sound like a problem. Good thing most of what you said isn't true. God, it's like he's trying to do a 4E video on a whim and proceeded to not look up anything about 4E. Also, this is the first time he says there's nothing to do outside of combat. Once again, that's just wrong. If you have a bad DM, you just go from fight to fight with nothing going on, but that would be on the DM, not the game itself. If they had just fixed a few of these things, it wouldn't have been an issue. Having recycled powers is fine, but not when you're required to take them and you don't have any other customizability. Holy shit, this guy! All of his worst takes are right at the end of the video. I guess it's because all his previous bad takes are just being condensed, so it's more noticeable. So, once again, because he keeps getting it wrong and I have to keep correcting him, the word-style powers are the only ones even close to being recycled, and even then they're unique. And there is customizability. And you should know this because you've played a bard, which is not an essentials class. And having a combat-focused game is fine, as long as the combat's fun. But it's not. I can't exactly rebut him on this one, since fun is subjective, but what I can say is they really seem to have not adjusted combat at all when it was going really slow. Everyone else either figured out the half health double damage thing, or looked it up online. He was likely playing this in the 2010s, which it's not like the internet didn't exist. I'm not saying the combat issue isn't a flaw, obviously it is if wizards changed all their monster math, but there was an easy fix. If combat is a slog, you probably think, Okay, well, monsters take too long to die, maybe we should reduce their health. By how much? Well, dividing by two is easy, let's just do that. Then the obvious problem with that is, well, if they have less health, they won't be dealing as much damage over a fight since they die sooner. How do we fix that? Well, if we divided the health by two, why not do the opposite and multiply the damage by two? That seems logical. And there you go, you fixed combat, and didn't take a PhD in game design to do it. You know, it's funny, I went in the script like, Puffin talks about fourth and my memory's playing it, this'll be fun. And I pulled out the book and I started reading through it. So he did read through the books. At least he's claiming he read through one book, so I don't understand how he's getting so many things wrong. I really did not want to give this game a negative video because I feel that it got a lot of hate when it came out. There was a lot of divisiveness whenever people hate or love a thing and it creates factions. I, I didn't want to feed into that. And I just wanted to talk about my memories playing the game, but god damn it, I just went back through the system again and all the memories came back. And by the time I got to the end of the script, it really ended up being like, Piffin complains about fourth edition for like however long this video is. Cause I, did, I just, I don't have a lot of positive things to say about it. At this point, I've noticed you don't have a lot of positive things to say about 4E Puffin. I actually think you haven't said anything positive about the game yet, but maybe we're getting there. I agree about 4E being divisive. I just think it gets an unnecessarily bad rap because of videos like this. Like, man, there's a reason people didn't play this game, you know? It's not only that, but I'm having to cut material out. Like, half the script is just ending up on the cutting room floor, and it's still the longest script I've ever written. If what's in here is the good stuff, I would love to see what he cut out. Because so much of what's in here is just wrong, so I'm sure plenty of what he cut was also just falsehoods. 
So when people were pointing to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which is a new system that came out this year saying, it's very similar to 4th Edition, I'm like, oh god, no, please, god, no! Let me be clear, I've played a few games of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it has borrowed a few mechanics from D&D 4E, same as 5th Edition, but they're still very different systems. Hearing Pathfinder 2nd Edition was similar to 4E got me interested, but when I looked at it, I just didn't know what people were talking about. Puffin is right in that they're very different systems. So that brings me back to my original thing. Why did I buy all the books? You know, the system's still pretty cool. I mean, powers, they're pretty awesome. And the magic items were helpful once a day because you could only use magic items once per day. Even this late in the video, he's saying new things that are just wrong. Maybe I've been playing with house rules this whole time, but I have no clue what he's talking about with the magic items. There are magic items with encounter and at will powers attached, so only getting one magic item a day makes no sense. I think there was some rule about only being able to use a certain amount of daily magic item powers once a day. That must be it, and I've never run into that issues. Again, maybe it's just a house rule. And the feats were there, and they just they they gave you like a niner bonus on certain niche things, and actually they were nerfed so hard they didn't really come into play that much. I can't comment on how hard feats were nerfed from 3.5 to 4e, but if they were, I bet you get a lot more feats in 4e than you did in 3.5. I know in 5e you get feats every 4 levels instead of every 2, and you have to give up your ability bonus to take one. 4e gives out feats like they're candy in comparison, so of course they'll be weaker, but they're not as bad as he's making them out to be. And despite all that, I still like 4th edition. And it's not just because of nostalgia, of memories of friends hanging out. It's only like 99% because of that. See, there's still like 1% of other reasons. You could have fooled me, man. Sounds like you really don't like 4E. But finally, after all the abuse he slung at 4E, we're finally going to get what he actually liked about it. I can't wait. I'm sure it will be something integral to the game and not something superficial that 5e could copy if they really wanted to. Like, uh... Formatting. I like how the book is formatted. It's a very readable book. You can't see my face, but imagine me looking deadpan into the camera. I can't believe the first thing he brought up was formatting. Well, maybe there's some other things that he likes. When it minions were, were great, until you found out that you used your most powerful ability on them. I agree minions are cool. It makes you feel like a badass mowing down a bunch of little guys. Using your good attack on one sucks, but that should only happen once. If you ever see a bunch of the same enemy, you should probably assume that they're minions. Hey, playing off of the, the monster's powers was kind of fun, and they were varied. Uh, very few enemies just kind of ran at you and swung their sword. Monster rolls and groups were kind of cool, even though they were kind of horrendously frustrating and slowed down combat. First of all, he couldn't even get three monster rolls correct. There's no striker or tank roll, at least not by those names. The closest to tank would probably be soldier, since they can sometimes mark you. The closest to a striker would either be a lurker or a skirmisher. They usually do lots of damage, but are pretty squishy if you can get them. I have no clue what he could mean saying monster rolls and groups could slow down combat. Monster rolls were a tool for the DM to make interesting encounters, so it should have no impact on what the players are doing. Also, we probably did run it wrong. I mean, they're not the easiest to run, but like we could have done better with them. And there it is, the real source of all his issues with the game. I've suspected this from the beginning. So many of the issues sound like it was just running the game issues and not issues with the system itself. But yeah, God, if you can't learn a system after playing it for over a year, like, it kind of feels like it's a little bit the fault of the system, maybe a little bit? Maybe it is the fault of the system a little bit. But when people are sleeping or playing games when it's not their turn, it really feels like you're not actually making an effort to learn the system. I'm not saying 4e isn't a crunchy system with lots of rules, but it was my first foray into tabletop RPGs and I had hardly any issues with it. I'm not sure if that says something about you or me, but it says something about one of us. I think a big part about why the problems didn't get solved was we the players kept expecting the DM to make the fights more manageable and he was kind of expecting us to take our turns faster and so on. And so we kept thinking that it was someone else's fault and because of that the problem never got solved. That certainly sounds like what the problem was with his group. But with the way he's described things, it sounds like the DM was really trying hard to run combat while everyone else just couldn't give a single shit. 
I keep thinking of the story he told with the sleeping people, and that does not sound like a group I would ever want to play with. The other thing is it was everyone's first RPG, and if it's everyone's first RPG, it's very difficult to tell what rules that are causing you this problem, and a lot of veteran RPG players can kind of transplant rules that they like from systems that they love, and this is your only RPG, like, you just play with what you got. You don't have, like, a library of rules that you can kind of pour it in. I know I just said this, but it's relevant again. 4E was my first RPG. It was also the first RPG of all the players, as far as I know. I'm not sure if the DM had played anything before, but he didn't give any indication that he had. So my group was basically the same as Puffins was, but we never had any of these issues. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but at the very least, it means if your first RPG is 4E, you're not universally in for a bad time. Anyway, that's 4th edition. Those are my memories playing it. Like I said, I like it, but it has problems. There's a reason why when 5th edition came out and said simpler, faster combat, I jumped on it. Really, I think 4th edition was very innovative and had many mechanics that were great and got ported over to other systems, and there were a lot of mechanics that just were, were not good, and then some mechanics I, I didn't like got ported over as well, but uh, whatever. But anyway, I still like it, so that's cool. Uh, those are my memories of 4th edition, Dungeons & Dragons. And there we have it, and boy was that a chore to get through. Ben claims to like 4E, but given the tone of this video, it just sounds like he mostly enjoyed hanging out with his friends and they just so happened to play 4E together. You're probably wondering why he even made this video. It was made years ago now. While it's true this video isn't anywhere close to his most popular, it barely cracks the top 30 last I checked, it still has 2.2 million views, which is a bunch. When I look at the comments, it's a bunch of people either agreeing with him, or even worse, people saying, oh yeah, 4E sounds bad, I'll never play it. It's the second type of comment that really gets me. The people who agree have made up their mind. They at least played 4E and decided they didn't like it. But the people who hear this video and decide 4E is bad based on all this faulty information just break my heart. 4E is a great system that deserves more love, and videos like this one just make sure people won't play it. And it's not even right. That's the worst part. If he was at least accurately representing the game, all I could say is, well, maybe you could at least give 4E a try. But since he's so inaccurate, people are getting an incorrect view of the game. If you've made it this far, then I appreciate you for watching. Leave a comment to let me know you watched it all. Use the word salmon so I know you heard this part. This video has been an albatross around my neck for so long. Finally getting it done really feels freeing, in a way. Maybe I'll eventually get to his video where he runs 4E for Joe Cat and a bunch of other D&D YouTubers that I've never heard of. That game has a whole host of other issues that I won't bother getting into right now. If you like this video, then maybe subscribe? I have no clue what I'll do next. This was sort of what I was leading up to when I started with the Tunic video a few months ago. Maybe I'll give Let's Playing another try. At any rate, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, I will bid you adieu.